Hello, and welcome back to The Hated and the Dead with Tom Lehman. The podcast has now had five five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts, and the number of downloads has doubled in the last week. Thank you for all your help so far. Keep reviewing, keep sharing, keep downloading. The subject of today's episode is Antonio Salazar. Antonio Salazar was the Prime Minister of Portugal between 1932 and 1968. Salazar was a dictator, but as my guest for today's podcast, Tom Gallagher, argues, he was a temperate dictator. Why should you be interested in him? Though Salazar was a contemporary of bombastic dictators Hitler and Mussolini, Salazar was personally bookish, mild-mannered and self-effacing. This makes him something of an anachronism to many. But Salazar wasn't just an interesting personality. His suspicion of politics and of politicians makes him the ultimate anti-populist. In an era where politics is increasingly dominated by loud characters overflowing with style but lacking substance, it might be pertinent to start asking the question, is democracy really the best system? Looking at Portugal's history, it's not entirely obvious that it is. Tom Gallagher is my guest for today. He is a professor emeritus at the University of Bradford. He is the author of 14 books, the latest of which is Salazar, the dictator who refused to die. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to introduce Antonio Salazar. Hi, Tom. How are you? I'm fine. I'm ready to go uh, discuss uh, the subject of my biography, the enigmatic Portuguese leader, Dr. Antonio Salazar. Brilliant. Okay. Well, let's let's jump straight into to talking about Salazar, Ben Tom. I've recorded four episodes of this podcast so far, and Salazar is the person about whom I've known the least going into the interview. Um, I think it'll probably be the case for most of the people listening too that they don't know an awful lot about this man. You've written quite an impressive list of articles and books about Salazar. Can you give a, a short BBC News headline, or maybe a GB News headline, even shorter, uh, of who Salazar was, and then explain why you think he's somebody worth knowing about? Temperate dictator, perhaps sums him up. Most dictators are loud, bombastic, um, disruptive, driven by personal appetites. Salazar wasn't. He was a kind of self-effacing, very personally self-controlled, uh, mild in his behaviour, but ruthless, single-minded, patient in, uh, in trying to win maintain his authority. I mean, he died at the age of 81 in 1970, but for 40 of, of his 81 years, he was either the economic strongman of Portugal or else was prime minister, which is uh, quite a record for someone with his uh, personality. It absolutely is. I, I, I want to come on to his temperament later on in the interview but first of all just to set the scene let's look at Portugal pre Salazar Portugal had become a republic in 1910 after nearly a thousand years of, of, of monarchic rule it obviously became one of the great imperial powers of the millennium during that time as well um, but the republic that took the monarchy's place was quite turbulent wasn't it what was the Portuguese economy and society like in the 1910s and 1920s well, the development which had occurred uh, in Portugal in previous centuries had arisen because of Brazilian gold. Uh, but the, the Napoleonic Wars were disastrous for the Iberian Peninsula. Both Spain and Portugal were ravaged by invading armies. Political instability undermined the legitimacy of the monarchy, which, as you pointed out, eventually was swept away in Portugal in 1910. Brazil had uh, declared independence in the 1820s. And um, basically, 
Portugal had a subsistence economy uh, reliant mainly on agricultural products, very low tax base, unable to pay its way, um, reliant on foreign loans. Uh, so, you know, there was a basis there for great frustration and instability. The result of this instability is that the army essentially took over Portugal in 1926. But Salazar doesn't become the leader of the country straight away. How does he get into a position whereby he ends up running Portugal for nearly 40 years? Well, I mean, the, the army was the only institution left standing which had any degree of national reach or prestige. But the officers were not cut out to cure the country's economic will, ills. There was great fear that Portugal would lose its colonial possessions uh, unless uh, the country recovered ec uh, economically. And Salazar was singled out by the armed forces to try and introduce a, a period of tough austerity. Uh, balance the books, introduce modern methods of financial efficiency in what was a broken down uh, state. Um, now, he could have just been uh, another um, transitory technical figure, but he bargained very skillfully with the military uh, and said, look, um, you know, we need to go far deeper than uh, merely a sort of economic cure. We need to build a different political system so that there will be sort of permanent order and stability and you can retreat with dignity to the barracks. And there were enough uh, soldiers who saw this as uh, an attractive proposition some, uh, and by 1932, he was Prime Minister. In 1933, a new constitution was uh, introduced. Portugal became a cooperative uh, uh, state. There were democratic elements to it, elected assembly, elected president. Uh, but but it, it was a right-wing Christian conservative political system that was installed. A great, complete break, complete rupture with how Portugal had been for the previous 110 years. I want to go into his politics a little bit deeper, Tom. I think one of the most interesting things about Salazar is that although he's often lumped in with fascist or ultra-nationalist leaders of his time, people like Hitler, Mussolini and obviously Franco, his next door neighbour in Spain, those comparisons are kind of shaky, aren't they? It, it, his, he wasn't uh, a fascist? Um, no, I mean, he, I mean, these were hyper-political figures on the, the sort of authoritarian right. I mean, they wanted to mobilise the populations. Uh, you know, there would be a strong party that was interfering at many different levels of society. So, uh, you know, it, it it was hyper politics. Salazar, by contrast, he saw politics even from the conservative wing of, uh, as usually disruptive uh, uh, and you know just ending up in futile um, waste uh, and uh, and disorder. He always argued that the most important freedoms actually lay outside politics and that they were imperiled by political parties because invariably these parties attracted restless, uh, ambitious people who put their own appetites before uh, uh, ev ev everything else. And Portugal had, and this was a very uh, persuasive argument for a country which had just emerged, as you say, from the Republic, 44 governments in 16 years. Uh, and people, you know, were, were just saturated with uh, politics and wanted a period of quiet. 
And uh, Salazar provided this. Obviously, he didn't just do it through his economic success, through persuasion. He, he had censorship, uh, a secret police uh, gradually uh, emerged, and um, you know, communists and liberals who became too noisy and demanding were quite firmly dealt with. Not executions or anything. Portugal had abolished the death penalty in the 1840s and it was never restored. I think in the context of the 1930s, people will find this attitude that he had, this sort of anti-political attitude, really interesting, given that in so many other countries, extreme political theory was running a, a mock, really. How did this attitude that Salazar had manifest itself in terms of the way he dealt with the church and civil society at large? I mean, one of the stereotypes uh, of Salazar is that he was a tool of the Catholic Church and, and that he, he was a creature who was trying to uh, impose superstition uh, and religious backwardness on a country which had known a lot of secular uh, changes. Uh, in fact, uh, some of Salazar's uh, most awkward opponents actually came from people in the ranks of the clergy who were really disappointed that he didn't turn the clock back to the sort of old uh, order of throne, altar and landowners. The um, Concordat was signed with the Vatican in 1940, which gave very few concessions uh, to Rome. And when a new Concordat was signed by the left-wing government uh, after Salazar's regime was toppled, they, they needed to change hardly anything because they were these secular uh, people were very happy with the deal that Salazar uh, had got. So he wanted to basically cut down to size various institutions whose egotism and uh, you know re readiness for conflict had done great harm uh, to Portugal, such as the army, such as the church, such as the business sectors. He didn't trust uh, capitalism, capitalists very much. He thought that they were they were often greedy and irresponsible, which is why the cooperative system was introduced, a system where there would be a lot of state oversight, basically his oversight yeah. uh, of, of the economy. He's, he's clearly not a, a populist. The thing that I've seen him described as most is a corporatist, which is the word you just used, somebody who basically manages relations between the state and and big business, but doesn't really embark on large-scale reform. I, I suppose the modern-day equivalent of that term is, is, is a technocrat. It's a word that we hear an awful lot. If you look at the menu of world leaders and national systems today, Tom, who do you think is closest to Salazar? It's, it's really difficult to give you a precise answer because he was uh, in charge for uh, 36 continuous years and you know, his, his rule went through different phases. I think if international crises hadn't intervened quite early on, probably it would have emerged into a quite sophisticated, depersonalised regime, rather like Gaulle's France, and there would have been, as the, the, the regime strengthened its hold on the country, took over its direction, Salazar would have faded uh, in, into the uh, uh, background. Um, I think it is possible to argue that if we are entering into a, an era of post-democracy in the West, then features of Salazar's rule will, rule will crop up. The opposition to popular sovereignty, the belief that electorates are, are, are too irresponsible, too easily swayed by demagogues really to be taken seriously. The need to control information the need to prescribe a set of norms that will be pushed in education, etc. I mean, those were features of Salazar's re regime. I wouldn't say that they were imposed in a in a very systematic way. Perhaps what we're seeing with the woke era is more systematic than what occurred 
uh, under uh, under Salazar. It's finally, it's also possible to say that his cooperative system was picked up by third wave politicians uh, like Tony Blair and Gerhard Schroeder in Germany, and things that used to be decided politically instead became decided uh, by pressure groups, charities, uh, 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 and were taken out of the realm of politics. Uh, and Salazar built up his support base by giving jobs, so many jobs to law graduates, etc. cetera, uh, you know, in controlling this big edifice of cooperative rules. You know, uh, uh, and you could argue that Blair and Brown and Cameron and who were engaged in the same kind of thing. You know, they weren't particularly attracted by their own parties, but, you know, they, they looked beyond to building up a state sympathetic uh, to their, uh, you know, ambition. Well, the, the, the reason I ask is that the one organisation that I kept thinking of and I sort of couldn't get out of my head when I was reading about Salazar was the European Commission in some ways because although the European Commission has a more um I would say socially liberal attitude than somebody like Salazar and it's substituted the sort of nationalism of somebody like Salazar for a more internationalist cosmopolitan viewpoint it certainly has the same objective of sort of um blurring democratic mandates and attempting th there's a very strong emphasis of continuity um with the european commission which i think is similar to something like salazar i mean terms like corporatist and technocrat are almost always used pejoratively today i think because governments of that nature as you've said they tend to restrict different uh interests and factions within the body politic but I, I think if you take the average person in a society, they probably aren't very political. They favour continuity. Um, they're suspicious of radical change and they want stable economics. In, in a way, I think if you're going to list the advantages of a technocratic system, the advantages of that system might look very much like a, a list of the failures of a more democratic or populist system. Technocracy must have some appeal to the the public, right? Uh, yes, um, uh, you could argue that the people in charge in Brussels and Salazar saw themselves as enlightened bureaucrats with the kind of the European motherland of Portugal uh, at, the, at, at, at heart, uh, and. Um, after the regime was toppled in the 1970s, four years after Salazar's death, there was a kind of avalanche of literature which painted it in the darkest terms, poverty, fear, uh, terror, uh, and backwardness, isolation, uh, etc. But opinion polls, even in the, the late 1970s, showed that there was a lot of attachment to the regime. People singled out, as you, the word that you use, con, uh, continuity. There was no inflation. All right, salaries were low, but because prices remained the same year after year, you could uh, you, you, you you could get by. So uh, you know the the system wasn't disruptive. There wasn't continuous sort of experiments, shake-ups, starting all over again so that people were just disorientated, wondering, you know, what on earth are they going to cook up next? Everything was calm. Everything was stable. Uh, and uh, so people who were asked about Salazar, and there was a, a, a actually a, a television competition in 2007. This was done in many countries. Who is the greatest greatest Portuguese? Salazar won hands down um, because a lot of, uh, of of people believed that he was a patriot. He had the interests of the people at heart, even though he was harsh and austere uh, at, at times. He was honest, and he certainly was honest. He died actually uh, uh, a poor uh, poor man. 
uh, and you know there were no personal excesses. So uh, you know, so he was seen, uh, especially after forty years of the democracy, which has plenty of shortcomings, uh, uh, as someone who might have been a fascist, you know, the popular term, but was a good fascist. That you know, he 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 had a, a good personal ethic, even though the people under him often didn't behave in a uh, you know a very inspiring way. Do we have many accounts of what he was like on a personal level? Because I, I saw a lot of photos of him when I was doing research for this. And when you look at pictures of Mussolini and Hitler, they, they're often dressed in military style outfits. It's all about the bombast and they look very pugnacious. Salazar looks like an academic. He, he didn't feel the need to present any kind of facade. For instance, uh, there was a very successful royal visit by Queen Elizabeth to Portugal just weeks after the Suez crisis uh, in 1957. And it was noted that when he received the Queen, when they sat down uh, for a musical evening uh, in the Lisbon Opera House, and, you know, he, he, he had no decoration. You know, he had received a lot of decorations. He never wore his decorations because he didn't feel he had anything to prove. So he, he was uh, uh, very uh, modest. Uh, he, he, he didn't see the need to give a lot of speeches, except at sort of difficult moments, maybe Second World War, back to the colonies uh, in, the, uh, in, in the early 1960s. He didn't go around with uh, Claxon's blaring. He lived an ordinary life. People knew that he lived an ordinary life. They, wa- they, wa- they did wonder about his domestic arrangements, about his relationship with Donna Maria, who was his housekeeper for uh, 50 years. But there was, there was, uh, she was just a, a, a devoted helper who he came to rely on. He wasn't a recluse. He, um, he received many people every day in the evening uh, got lots and lots of petitions and letters, which were replied to. Uh, uh, so, uh, so it was a, a rather unusual, low-key form of rule uh, in which he was invisible for much of the time. But you know, people could reach out and communicate uh, with him. Let's talk about. You mentioned the empire a second ago. How did Salazar accommodate Portugal's empire? Um, because obviously it still had a number of colonies. Um, which colonies uh, did Portugal have during Salazar's rule, first of all, and how did he uh, accommodate them? Well, I mean, th- there were quite a lot of colonies, but two stand out above all the others, uh, 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 Angola, and Mozambique, Mm -hmm. uh, they were about the size of Western and Central Europe, so they were very large uh, um, territories. The colonies were important to Portugal psychologically because of its small European dimensions. They fed the illusion that it was somehow a world power, even though it couldn't often balance its books uh, at at home. Um, Salazar like most Portuguese, uh, was a nationalist. It was only the communists up until the end of the 1960s who wanted to decolonize. His opponents, uh, even Mario Suarez, the best known uh, post uh, Salazar democratic politician, you know, wished Portugal to remain uh, in Africa. The colonies were neglected by uh, Salazar, as they were, I think, by most European rulers, um, because of the amount of problems at home in the intervention of economic crises. As you will know, I think, that Britain was Portugal's oldest ally. Yeah. And the fact that they were both involved in imperial endeavours 
that had helped underpin the alliance. Probably the most disastrous international um, decision for Portugal that occurred during Salazar's time in power was the British decision to rapidly decolonize. I mean, this came actually uh, out of the blue. I mean, it was assumed that India would receive major autonomy, but uh, until British power was shown to be diminished by the Second World War, uh, it, the, the speed and the, uh, uh, the completeness of the imperial retreat was envisaged by very few people. So uh, India lost Goa, its oldest colony, as a result of Britain uh, leaving uh, uh, India. Portugal uh, lost Goa, right? Yes, Portugal okay. yeah. uh, uh, lost Goa. And I think the Suez crisis uh, uh, and the, the way that uh, it had been mishandled by Britain and also by the United States made uh, the colonial question uh, one of the first rank. Uh, and port there was no internal debate within the regime. There was debates on lots of issues. I mean, Salazar wasn't someone who just said, this is what I worked out and it's going to happen. He, d he discussed with his ministers options, but there was no debate about whether Portugal uh, should bow to the wind of change of Harold Macmillan and leave along with the other European powers. No, Portugal was going to stay. We haven't been in Africa yesterday like some people. We've been there for 400 years and we, we're not there for interest. We're there for, because we see it as an extension of uh, the homeland. Uh, and uh, so, and it led to a huge confrontation with the United States. Uh, the Kennedy administration actually tried to topple Salazar in a similar way uh, that it tr that tried to get rid of the Vietnamese leader Diem in 1963. Uh, but Salazar was wily uh, and he defended them all. Uh, and in the end, it was the Americans that retreated and decided, well, Portugal's an exception. You know, it, it's going. It wants to stay in Africa. It's got a different historical mission. Uh, so this was a late uh, triumph for Salazar. But the colonies were the downfall of uh, you know the colonial war was the downfall of his uh, regime. It didn't have enough money uh, to fight wars in three different countries. It lacked international support. Uh, you know, was increasingly uh, ostracized at the United uh, uh, Nations, and too much of a burden was placed on the military. Uh, repeated terms of service. The, uh, the guerrilla fighters, the liberation fighters, were not particularly formidable for uh, fewer Portuguese troops died between 1961 and 74 than died, than people, Portuguese died in traffic accidents in the early 1990s. But it was, it was just the inertia, the discomfort. Salazar was replaced by another university professor, Marcelo Caetano, when he became seriously ill in 1968. And he didn't have Salazar's instinct and the, the military were able to remove him very easily. If, if we just go back a second, I want to talk about the end of the regime. You've mentioned him a few times as being quite a, a clever, canny autocrat. Can you go into detail a bit more about how he managed to keep the population in tow for such a long time? Well, you asked about his sort of uh, cleverness, craftiness. Um, this is the, the moment to mention that he was the son of a peasant uh, and he learned how to negotiate. I mean, you, peasants, farmers are usually very good at nego negotiating far more than urban people. And he, he picked up these uh, skills from his parents who, who were 
unusual in their village in being able to read and write. Uh, and they were involved in small scale property transactions. His mother also ran a small tavern. Uh, and he, uh, so, so he came to be respected by the population because of his abilities, the fact that he was able to outclass uh, a succession of rivals and fend off uh, uh, important uh, global players. The Americans in the Second World War, and later, as I mentioned, the British, uh, who clashed with Salazar in the Second World War on different things, but never wanted to overthrow him because they were convinced chaos would return if uh, he, once he, 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 he was gone. Uh, and for many people uh, who saw Portugal as kind of falling behind in the post-war uh, um, opportunities uh, were passing it by, that were transforming France, Germany, even Spain. Uh, nevertheless, he was a guarantee of stability uh, which the Portuguese had, had very little of uh, for many years before he, 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 he came to power. So uh, he, his, um, his style of uh, rule, which was firm but seen as fair, where he got no personal benefit, did uh, appeal to many people. Uh, but not, you know, there were times when people felt that he's been around for too long, time for change. Uh, one of those was in 1958 when there was a major electoral challenge from a dissident army officer. Salazar dies in 1970 and Portugal becomes a democracy during the 1970s over the course of that decade. Um, what is the complexion of the new republic after Salazar? Do you know what? The new republic is very like the old republic. It has become increasingly uh, 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 similar. Why has it not suffered the fate of uh, the old republic? Because it has been locked into a stable uh, uh, system, the European Union, which Portugal joined uh, in 1986, has provided a lot of funding, uh, uh, much of which has been intercepted by the political class. But nevertheless, enough ha has enabled the country to modernise in, uh, in, in, in different places. So it, whenever there's a lot of money around in the political system, then conflict tends to be dampened down. I mean, in the pre-Salazar Republic, the, the country was broke and people were be fiercely fighting over small, limited resources. There was a lot of money uh, around until 2010, when Portugal was badly scarred by the Euro crisis hasn't recovered from that. Uh, and uh, since then, politics have become more polarised uh, and uh, the atmosphere is starting to resemble the uh, one before 1926. The Socialist Party is quite autocratic and uh, is trying to basically remove the neutrality of a lot of institutions in the justice sector, uh, etc. Uh, and so slowly Portugal is becoming a turbulent place after, as Spain is too actually, after about 30 years of stability. It, it's funny really because in some ways um, Spain and Portugal until recently were seen as the last bastions of um, kind of third wave centrist politics. I mean, even now, Portugal, um, it's kind of extreme or radical left and right wing parties poll 
quite poorly by modern European standards, especially if you compare them with, with say, France or Italy or Greece. Why do you think it took a little bit longer for Spain and Portugal to catch up with the rest of Europe and the Western world in becoming more polarised politically? I, I think living standards uh, improved. Uh, emigration was an outlet in the 80s uh, and 90s and uh, not is. And there was a degree of consensus between uh, le left and right. It was perhaps broken when the current Prime Minister Costa decided to take the communists and the Trotsky out into his governing arrangements. That was seen as breaking a taboo. Uh, and you do have a right wing party, Chega, which is growing uh, quite, quite vigorously. I would say that Portugal still stands out because uh, a lot of people are depoliticized. They, they distrust politicians. I suppose, in a way, this is a throwback to uh, to to Salazar. Yeah. Think, uh, that nothing good uh, usually comes from uh, you know politicians. Uh, so you know the pace of politics is is, is quite meager. Uh, the and the population drain in Portugal is massive, and I think a lot of discontented people, as was the case in Ireland after it got independence in 1922, have left rather than caused disruption at home. And is is that? Do you think that Salazar's legacy, in some ways, when people think of Salazar now or think back to his era? Do they think of a first and foremost of a of a quieter political era? Do you think that's his legacy? Well, uh, yes. Uh, um, I mean, the, the people who, uh, who 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 dominate communications, you know, depict it as a, a dark night of repression and backwardness. But they often are not. not regarded with much credibility uh, and you know there is a folk memory of Portugal having counted under Salazar the currency was strong strongest one of the strongest currencies in Europe decade after decade after currency being a joke under the uh, first republic that uh, you know that the, the, there was law and order people were happy uh, uh, even though there was obviously a lot of misery, etc. I mean, research now has shown that literacy grew uh, at a huge pace uh, under Salazar uh, in the 40s and 50s, uh, and uh, infant mortality collapsed. Uh, sorry, it, it, it fell substantially. So there was development uh, through... Uh, this this period, uh, and Portugal has simply been run in a very mediocre basis for a long, long time now. For uh, politicians to insist, we saved you from fascism, to you know, to be treated with any degree of seriousness. Salazar is regarded, uh, even by people who would oppose what he stood for, as the most significant. Uh, politicians seen in Portugal for hundreds of years uh, and uh, someone with his unusual mix of ability is unlikely to come along anytime soon. Well, it, it's certainly quite an anachronistic figure by modern standards. He's somebody that doesn't really fit the modern standards or, or categories of, of politics particularly well. But I, I've I've really enjoyed finding out about him today tom um it's been a really good conversation thank you very much for for agreeing to to talk to me um where can people find your work where can people read you well uh my life of salazar was published by hearst publications uh and if you go to their website then the book can actually be obtained at a very economical price it's on sale at the various internet uh, places. Uh, a Portuguese 
translation was uh, brought out this uh, summer. A um, lot, lot more extra material in it. And I think there will be a first, we'll be bringing a paperback, which hopefully will be expanded uh, next year. Brilliant. Um, Tom, it's, it's been a, a, a real pleasure talking to you. So uh, thank you very much. All right, Tom. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Hated and the Dead. If you've enjoyed this podcast, follow it on Spotify or Apple Podcasts to get updates whenever new episodes are released. If you're just on that last stretch of your commute to or from work, or have a spare two minutes, please leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It's the best way to help the podcast grow.